welcome to the May RISC Ottawa Centre meeting. We have a very, very full program tonight. And we have a bit of a problem. So tonight is one of those nights where we're going to have to ask you to leave as soon as the meeting is over. So that means um, at 10 p.m. we're really going to have to cut it off and be out of here as soon as possible. Now we didn't know about this, so we did program a very, very, very big meeting. So we've got a lot of stuff coming for us. Um, we're going to have Dave Chisholm's usual Ottawa Skies. Followed by a special guest, we have a guest speaker today, John Evans, who's going to be speaking about astronaut psychology. Then I believe we have an FLO update, could that be it? Yep. So after the break, we're going to have uh, another GA update with Tim. And then uh, one of your counselors, Jim Sophia, is going to be presenting some of the survey results from that survey we sent out a few months ago. We know that's highly anticipated. And finally, we've got just a few observations. Like I said last month, we have lots and lots and lots of observations this month. So we'll see if we can get through them. So new members this month, we've only got two, Nathan Mitten and Kyle Flynn. Welcome. <laughs> so another thing we wanted to highlight this month is the little Google Doodle. This went by on April 26th. It's the day that the Cassini probe uh, took a deep dive through Saturn and its rings. So this is part of Cassini's grand finale, uh, meaning that in the near future, it's, well, it's going to send back a few pictures and then it's going to crash into Saturn's atmosphere. So this is really its grand finale. This is what we've been waiting for the whole time. Members in the news, you may have heard of this. It's very exciting. Asteroid Gary Boyle. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this was an asteroid, I believe, discovered in 1995. It has an orbital period of about three and a half years. Gary isn't here tonight, but I think he deserves at least a good round of applause. <laughs> Is it going to be a crater, Gary Boyle? Yeah. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, on a sadder note, a longtime member of our Sandra Ferguson passed away. Um, she's held some very important positions over the years. They're always big here. And so her family invites you to her celebration of life, June 10th, and it's in Richmond. So if you want more info about that, you can just contact me. So I'll hand the mic over to Dave for this month's guide. Yeah, this remote is just that one. Okay. So good evening folks, let's take a look at what's happening in the skies, if we ever see any skies. It's certainly been a little cloudy the last little while. Uh, so full moon is on uh, May, the, uh, May the 10th. Peak viewing is uh, tomorrow night. I don't think we're going to be able to accomplish that. So you've got the 8 backwards meteor shower, um, 60 meteors per hour on a even if we did have clear skies, the moon's going to be interfering with it. Uh, however, if, if you get clear skies in a few days after that, it, it, it spans a fairly large range of time from April 19th to May the 28th. Uh, we have a comet, uh, Pan-STARRS, that is still visible until uh, mid-May. Mercury. So, um, it's, uh, we've got the Mester, Maximum Western Elongation on May the 17th. It's one of the few times you'll be able to see Mercury just before sunrise. Venus is uh, visible in the early morning sky all month, and Mars is visible in the early evening sky all month. Jupiter is visible all month. It's, uh, it's great in the evenings when we had our uh, event last, uh, last weekend. It was, it was uh, beautiful and clear. Saturn is visible late evening all month, and by next month it'll be uh, 
up at a reasonable time uh, for uh, the younger uh, viewers. Uranus is visible in the last part of the month in the early morning, and Neptune is visible in the early morning all month. In terms of the International Space Station, best viewing date is May the 23rd at um, yeah, around 11 o'clock at night. There's the path that it's going to take across the skies. And there's the cartoon for the month. <laughs> and I think I've got something queued up next. This was in the news recently in CBC. <laughs> Has anybody seen Steve? Well, there's Steve. The, this Aurora feature was first posted in the Facebook group of the Alberta Aurora Chasers last year. Initially, most users thought they were looking at a proton arc, which is a rare type of aurora which isn't caused by electrons hitting the Earth's magnetic field, but by more massive protons falling in an energetic event on the Sun. Eric Donovan from the University of Calgary is one of the first scientists who saw Steve. Uh, it's about 25 to 30 kilometers wide arc that aligns east-west and can extend over hundreds of miles. He recognized that this wasn't a proton arc for a number of reasons, including the fact that the proton aurora is hardly visible. Professor Donovan spoke to colleagues and eventually managed to get ESA's Swarm <coughs> Magnetic Field Mission, a constellation of satellites tasked with studying the Earth's magnetic field, to study more of Steve's shows. It didn't take too long before the satellites flew straight through Steve and learned some new things about it. The temperature, 300 kilometers above the Earth's surface, jumped by 3,000 degrees Celsius uh, when they encountered Steve. The data revealed a 25 kilometer wide ribbon of gas flowing westwards at about 6 kilometers per second, compared to a speed of about 10 meters per second either side of the ribbon. Turns out that Steve is actually a remarkably common uh, event, but we hadn't noticed it before. It's thanks to ground-based observation satellites, today's explosion of access to data, and an army of citizen scientists joining forces to document it. So where did the name Steve come from? Well, because they knew it wasn't a proton arc, they didn't know what to call it. Uh, so Steve was named in honor of the children's movie Over the Hedge, which the creatures arbitrarily conjure up a name Steve to describe an object they were not sure about. So that's who Steve is. Thank you. All right, so for our main talk, I just want to give a little intro, because um, this is kind of special to me. It's nice, uh, in the last month, we've seen an increasing number of youth members getting involved, either uh, in council, behind the scenes, um, but what we haven't had in a really long time is a youth speaker. So I'm going to let him introduce himself, but I would like you to give a very warm welcome to my very good friend, John Evans. All right, so I guess just a little intro about me. I'm John Evans, I'm 17. Uh, I'm currently attending Heritage College uh, for Sciences Program, but we'll be attending the Royal Military College next year in engineering. Uh, I'm currently uh, an Air Cadet 653 Squadron, and with that I took an advanced aerospace course over the summer, which is where most of this information was drawn from. Um, uh, the information was composed by me and three other people, uh, who are Alexis Kaiser, uh, Victor Bichette, Jacob Gagne. Uh, it was presented at a space expo that took place over the summer. Uh, and that's about it, so I guess we'll get on to the presentation. It's also shorter than it was supposed to be. Uh, and I'm sorry if I talk fast, kind of nervous. Uh, so to start off, astronauts are supposedly the best, strongest, smartest, and bravest of humanity. But can they still crack under the pressure of space? In training, they undergo a variety of mental and physical evaluations to measure their optimal performance for the challenges of space. Being the greatest among us, how come their personal feelings and well-being aren't a common subject when discussing life in space? Astronauts can spend as much of a, as a year away from the planet Earth, but how do they deal with this isolation? In this talk, it will be answered if loneliness can affect an astronaut's performance, and if so, how can they deal with this in the limited time that they are given? So, Isolation is defined as a process or act uh, of isolating or being isolated. Although temporary periods of isolation can provide benefit uh, to the psychological state of a person, large periods of isolation can have very damaging effects. Uh, 
Astronauts being isolated for nearly the entirety of their missions know this best. Unlike isolation on Earth, astronauts can't simply get up, go out, take a walk, with their, or talk with their family whenever they want. And how does this affect the brain? Well, these effects can include mental conditions, varying between but not restricted to sleep deprivation, depression, anxiety, or even solipsism syndrome, which is, refers to a psychological state in which the person feels as though the world is basically inside of their mind, they're making it all up, and they feel as though they are God. Uh, Astronauts can also start to become nuisances towards their goals of their missions because of the deterioration, deterioration of their mental state. So, uh, an experiment taking place in 2010 in Moscow, Russia, uh, called the Mars 500 mission, uh, was a mission simulating, uh, basically, what would happen if we were to send astronauts to Mars on a large scale. It showed that the monotonous routine of space travel could seriously affect the mental state of astronauts. Matthias Basner of the University of Pennsylvania said that all of the astronauts were falling apart in terms of their attention systems. Despite attempts uh, of keeping these astronauts stimulated during their 17th month mission, uh, with diversions such as video games, DVDs, or books, four of the six men studied were found to have extreme negative mental effects. The first of the men started living a 25 hour day, which threw him completely off schedule uh, with the other astronauts within a week. The second man to suffer psychological effects managed to sleep well at night, but took very long naps during the day, which would uh, have compromised uh, the state of a real mission. The third man suffered from chronic sleep deprivation and committed most of the mistakes made during the simulation. The fourth man succumbed to extreme depression. According to Stephen Lockley, a neuroscientist who studies uh, sleep medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, having some of the six crew members with different schedules and a different amount of sleep would likely make for poor team performance and increased risk of accidents and injuries in a real life situation. With a Martian day being slightly longer than an Earth day, which a Martian day is approximately 24.65 Earth hours, the chances of the problems becoming worse or becoming more common is even higher than on Earth. So the previous uh, paragraph outlined how the isolation affects the astronauts and how it can cause them to develop mental issues and screw up their missions. On the ISS, the astronauts are isolated for up to a year and need to retain their integrity in order to complete missions and not wind up dead. Astronauts need something to do on their free time in order to combat the stress brought on by isolation. This can be done in many ways, uh, such as making company with yourself, talking to your family as much as possible, uh, exercising, going online, playing instruments, and just generally keeping busy. Another aspect to combating isolation is that the astronauts can just forget about their worldly struggles and look into the vast expanse called space, but that could still result in solipsism syndrome, which as I said before, will cause you to believe that you are God. Uh, one of the main as ways astronauts can combat stress is by making friends with themselves. When the astronauts are floating in space, they are given limited time to talk to their friends and family, which means that they have quite a bit of time with themselves uh, to just think. One core quality the astronaut needs is the ability to be happy in his own company, so they will never truly be lonely. This can be related back to the first few weeks at a new job, where the new employee in question will not know anybody, meaning that they cannot rely or tell anybody anything because they really have no friends or connections yet. Uh, the person in question will combat this by isolating themselves and learning to enjoy their own company. This is the same thing that happens on the ISS. Astronauts must be their own best friend or not to succumb to stress. Astronauts can also combat stress by befriending their fellow crew members. This will allow them to feel included, feel included and as though they are not completely alone in space. Even when NASA is selecting astronauts, they choose people who will socialize and won't put themselves over the team. Notable examples of this include the Apollo 12 crew. The three crew members spent all of their time together, drove matching cars, and overall became best friends, which led, which led to the succession of the Apollo 12 mission because of the synchronization of the three. An example of how not cooperating with your crewmates themselves uh, crewmates can compromise the mission is the shuttle Mir missions. American astronauts found themselves isolated due to not being able to speak to their Russian counterparts. The reason uh, for these slip-ups was not only due to lack of communication, but also due to power cuts and a collision with the resupply ship. Uh, in 2010, ISS astronauts were able to connect to Wi-Fi while aboard the satellite. This NASA decision greatly helps combat isolation and stress, for astronauts can now communicate easier with their families on Earth. 
A normal example of this helping astronauts is Chris Hadfield, who spent his free time making edu educational videos and playing guitar, which allowed him to take his mind off of his loneliness and isolation. Astronauts can also use the internet to interact with the entire world using Twitter or Facebook, uh, and even if they are somewhere with little social interaction. But life in space isn't such, isn't as much a battle within a person's mind as this speech has so far made it up to be. Astronauts sometimes get a little help from certain drugs. Modafinil is a drug that promotes wakefulness and treats multiple sleep disorders such as narcolepsy and excessive daytime sleepiness. The astronauts are member of, members of the Air Force. It is allowed to be used as a medication to temporarily increase mental sharpness. Most of the negative uh, side effects that have seen astronauts uh, that have been seen in astronauts when they are either in real life or simulated isolation scenarios can be treated with this drug. It increases histamine productions and modifies the brain production of dopamine. The drug is kept in multiple doses on spacecraft in case a member falls psychologically ill due to the aloofness and the, uh, due to the aloofness and the symptoms can be treated with it. In case of a complete mental breakdown where an astronaut becomes psychotic or suicidal, NASA has protocols in place to tie him or her, him or her down with duct tape or a bungee cord, and then administer a tranquilizer to not only them, but the entire crew to ensure that nobody else uh, cracks. Uh, so to conclude, the use of drugs on space station makes the minor side effects of constant isolation more easily managed and makes minor side effects of isolation more easily controlled. Uh, astronauts try their best. Oh, I have to go back. So astronauts try their best to cope with the isolation of space, as mentioned earlier on. There comes a point when they're going to need more help than just that. Uh, among all of the, among all of the small efforts from Earth, which do help most astronauts, there is one effort that is slightly more noticeable than the rest. On June 27, 2013, the robot Kirobo was the world's first robot astronaut. It was revealed to the public for the first time. Uh, as being 35 centimeters tall. And its mission is uh, to be there for the astronauts in case they need somebody to just talk to. Uh, he is a Japanese robot who has voice recognition and communicate with them easily, as if he were a human himself. Following behind Kurobo was a backup member named Mirata, who is the exact same as Kurobo, but was made, Kurobo, but was made shortly after. Kurobo's mission ended on May 2014 uh, with the words, I'm a little tired, so I'll take a rest for a while but I hope you look up at the sky sometimes and think of me. He stayed on the ISS until he was brought home on February 11th by, uh, on the Dragon 5 by SpaceX. In conclusion, this report brings back instances where astronauts have been psycholog psychologically affected by isolation. The effects of the isolation and what humanity is currently doing to stimulate the minds of our space explorers. It is important to know about the isol isolation of space for it brings us closer to worry-free space travel. In the future, mankind is attempting to uh, communicate to space with little to no delay and trying to send gifts uh, to astronauts in space to advance our war on isolation. Overall, we are getting closer and closer to completely getting rid of this feeling of isolation in space. Thank you. So if there are any questions, I can try my best to answer them. Uh, the there. Jonathan, have, have, they, have they had any instances really where people kind of lost it while they were in space? Uh, there is a book written by a Russian cosmonaut. Uh, I can't remember the name offhand. It was something like 125 days in space about his experience orbiting Earth. And he talked about how he was feeling himself like he was going insane. But there wasn't any really documented cases. Yes? <laughs> uh, you, you talk about uh, methods they have to stop astronauts feeling so isolated in, in Earth orbit. Uh, w what are they considering for longer missions, like, for example, the mission to Mars? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that information is still classified by NASA or other sources because they're trying to maintain the integrity of the astronauts as if they would never actually go insane, or if they would never actually crack under space. So it's actually pretty hard to research this. Fair. Yes? Yeah, in the 70s, there was a mission called Skylab. And uh, the third mission, the crew actually mutinied and turned everything off for a day. Oh, I... That's something you should think, look up. I'll look that up whenever I get home. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? When they did in Buzz Aldrin's book, Return to Earth, have you seen that book? Yeah. It's about his psychological paralysis after the mission. It's a very good book, actually, because he had a complete breakdown. All right, I'll research into that, too. This was done, we were given about a week to research this before the actual space expo, so it's kind of like rushed research, rushed everything. Uh, any other questions?
Oh, uh, one at the back. A number of years ago, we had the Canadian Space Agency who was was training the astronauts. He gave a talk to us and he was talking about how they actually select the astronaut. Do you know if they're actually now training astronauts for isolation, or are they just trying to test the astronauts to study isolation? I believe right now they're just focusing more on studying it because they can't really treat it if they don't know exactly what's going on. So I know more and more missions are ongoing, especially for if we were to travel to Mars within the distant future or near future. Any other questions? Yes? How might VR influence the astronauts? Uh, like virtual reality? Yeah. Uh, that wasn't, I didn't really get to research what that. Do you think you're oh, what do I think about it? Yeah. Uh, I think that. Uh, it may make it easier because then they could actually feel as though they were back on Earth, but VR is still it's very, I guess, in its early stages on Earth, so going to space might be more of a long-term thing. Any other questions? Yes? Um, you know you were talking about that experiment with like six men were tested? Yeah, Mars 500. Yeah, were there any women in there? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Okay. I believe it was mostly comprised of men. Uh, but they're all from different countries, Canada, or not Canada, but the US, China, Russia, Poland. Uh, I believe I saw a question up there. No? Yeah, Rob. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, just wondering with the, the compound or the, the base they have up, uh, up in Canada's north, Devon, I think, or Devon Island? Uh, alert? Uh, not so much alert, but the <laughs> simulation of uh, Mars base up there. I was just wondering, people go up there for a while. Uh, that falls under the whole classified category because the government's still trying to keep it classified. <laughs> Honestly, uh, we, uh, as a re whenever we were researching, we tried so hard to find out, and we were wondering why we couldn't really find anything. Then we came across one page that actually said that NASA was classifying the majority of information, along with other uh, governments, because they wanted to make astronauts still look like they were the best, like they were the strongest. So, yes. I, I think they probably pre-screen astronauts and give them a number of personality tests or whatever to see who would be more resilient for something like this. Did you, would you agree? Yeah, I actually said that earlier on that when NASA is selecting astronauts, they're for people who are more like likable with their comrades, yeah. and they look, they really test mentally on like kind right. of what can happen and how they would react. So basically, if you have already, if you already have pre-existing conditions such as depression. Uh, if you do have narcolepsy, insomnia, any of that, you would be almost immediately taken off as soon as they found that out. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a quick talk about public outreach. Mike is going to speak to most of this, but I'd just like to start by saying a few words about International Astronomy Day, which was on Saturday, April 29th. So we have some activities here at the Aviation and Space Museum. Um, we did have an indoor display promoting the society, um, interacting with people. Chuck had his crater display out. Uh, but most popular was the solar observing. So there were six or seven members who set up their scopes outside and offered free solar observing. And I think there was Venus too that was out. It was very, very popular. We had a steady stream of people all day long. And I believe, yep, Tim Cole also had the museum's planetarium up. We had about 100 people going through there. And at night, oh, at night we held our very first public star party of the year. It was, actually very popular, especially in a new location. So there were about 200, 250 people who showed up for that. But um, it was a very, very cold night. So it ended a little earlier than we would have liked. So here you go, Mike. Oh, so yeah, I just want to say a quick thank you to all those who volunteered. Frank, Jimmy, Dave, Tim, Attila, Ingrid, Rob, Richard, Paul, Wolf, Chuck, Chris, Janet, and Gordon. Thank you. Uh, That's a big button. A big button, of course. 
Hi everyone, just wanted to talk about a few things, uh, a few events coming up for our club. I um, wanted to share with you um, just a couple of volunteer opportunities. The first one is um, uh, solar observing at the uh, Deep and Bunker site. Uh, I think mo many of you know that we hold our, our public stargazing at the, um, in the parking lot of the CARP library, the, um, uh, the CARP library. And in order for us to do that, we have to get pr approvals from the city, uh, which requires um, permission from two, two groups. One is the CARP Public Library um, um, management team and also the Diefenbucker staff as well. So whenever we get an opportunity, whenever they reach out to us to sort of say, can you help us with an event, I really um, jump at the opportunity to, to return the kindness. So they've asked us on Father's Day, on June the 18th, to work with them on, on um, sort of a joint programming here. They've got a number of events throughout the day and uh, they asked if we could do something in the day. And I said, well, what we do is we can do solar observing. So um, I'm putting on a call for folks with and without uh, solar equipment. If you want to join, uh, please, uh, please join us. I'm, we're expecting about, um, I can't remember what I said, about 250 people. And um, it should be a, a, good, a good day. So if you're interested in, uh, in volunteering, let me know. Obviously, that's weather permitting. Uh, coming up is our, um, please announce our public uh, stargazing uh, pr program. It's, uh, you'll see it on our website uh, posted uh, soon. We're at the final stages of approval with the uh, City of Ottawa um, to, to uh, enter and use their, um, their, uh, their, their property in, in CARP. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's, at the, um, it's right beside the Deepen Bunker uh, in the uh, parking lot of the CARP branch of the Ottawa Public Library. So here's the schedule, and again, it will be posted on, on, on the web, hopefully within a week. Like in previous years, we always have a target date and followed by a series of alternate dates. Um, we we um, usually aim for one event per month, okay? You'll notice there's an exception here with uh, June. June 30th, that's the date that, Brian, do you know what that date is? June 30th. Yes, that's the, uh, the Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 the, uh, that's, uh, the, the first day of the, yeah, the first day of the uh, General Assembly. That's right, the first day of the, the General Assembly. Sorry, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as part of the General Assembly, we have a uh, um, stargazing, and, and that's what that day is all about. Um, last year, it was pretty, it was uh, um, rather peculiar because most of our first dates, or over our primary dates there, we actually had our stargazing on most of those dates. So uh, fingers crossed that the, the, the weather will pass. And um, the next event is obviously targeted for March, May the 19th, so whatever that is, a couple of weeks from now. Now, something, I want to mention a couple of things here. So uh, what we did is we, uh, there's a lot of thought put into these, these dates and so forth. Most of our CARP star party dates, our public stargazing dates, what we aim to do is we aim to have it on nights where the moon comes up um, uh, after midnight. All right, it's a good way of uh, sort of finishing off the evening, make sure that people don't stay too late. Um, but also what, what that does is it allows us to have um, the, the moonless nights. We can save those for uh, other events. You'll see here now that um, what we have, what we scheduled in is members only events at our, at our uh, Fred Lawson Observatory. So one of the things that, we, um, that was mentioned that gives sort of a common message that came back in the uh, survey as, as, um, as Jim said you will talk about in a few minutes is that um, our members wanted more group events, group observing events, and that's what that, those are all about there. So we have, um, um, it comes to about almost, uh, yeah, it comes to one event per month. There's a, they're, they're typically moonless nights, or, or, or almost moonless, and uh, we ho hope you can join us. Um, as in previous years, we've got, uh, the, the Q Gallery has asked us to support them on, um, on their uh, Nocturne Festival. It's a festival where they celebrate the uh, night sky with music, with, um, with uh, art, uh, uh, astronomy themed art, and, uh, and, and so forth. And, we, and we, we, uh, they asked us to join us uh, to support them in two ways. One way is for astronomy talks, to provide astronomy talks, to support them in astronomy talks, and a number of members have, uh, here have actually uh, talked at the, in the Cube Gallery in the past. And also uh, with um, sidewalk astronomy. Now, these sidewalk astronomy events have been really popular in, uh, in the past for us because they've, they've served as feeder events for our, our uh, CARP stargazing uh, program and so forth. Great. So it's been a great way for us to raise awareness about ourselves. Uh, Eric LeMay is, uh, is up for one of the talks, so uh, please, uh, please, join, please join Eric. Now you'll notice there that the Friday, July 7th, um, that event actually overlaps with, uh, with the meeting, with the, um, 
our, our July meeting here. So that's that's a contract I just want to raise that to your attention. If you're interested in supporting that, please see me. Um, and uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention about star parties is we need a star party coordinator. So we've got a schedule in place now. We need somebody that can um, that can help make go no go calls. We need so an overall coordinator that can help promote them and, and issue emails to the group and uh, and answer questions that come in and so forth and uh, and work with the on site. Uh, we need to have on site supervisors and so forth. So if, if you're new to the club and you're interested in in, um, in volunteering and uh, well here's an opportunity. Let me know. And it's a lot of fun. I can tell you everything you need to know. Okay, I think that's about it for me. Right. Right. Yes. I'm curious about your October, I think it was the October one. Right. The, the uh, date was the 20th, the rain date was the 12th. Yeah. Do you have a better time machine? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'll have to take a look at that. Uh, uh, Chris, can you go back a couple slides? Can I do that? <laughs> October. Yeah, that really looks like it's backwards there. So, this, uh, you passed the uh, observing test here. <laughs> okay, is that it? Thanks, everyone. Alright, so next up is Gordon with a few updates on the Fred Lawson Observatory. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, first of all, um, as you may recall, we were missing a uh, director for the FLO. And if you read your astronauts, you'll know that uh, David Lozo and Rick Scholes uh, stepped forward and to be co-directors uh, co of the FLO. And their appointment has been approved by council. So thank you guys very much. One of the things uh, we've been talking about doing for a while, and it came up in the survey, is the warm room at the FLO. A lot of you said that you'd use the FLO a lot more if the warm room were available. So one of the things we'll be doing shortly, there's no fixed date in this, but it'll be happening probably within the next month, uh, we'll be installing a, a digital lock on the door to the warm room. And the combination to the lock will be the same as the gate. So if you don't know what the gate combination is, come see some me or Tim or Mike or somebody. Okay? Not me, I don't know it. Yeah, well, <laughs> go see Mike. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you if you're like these two more uh, above those, <laughs> um, you can you can email me at contact R S C whatever whatever it is R S C Ottawa dot yeah if you go to our website <laughs> and you click on contact that email comes to me and I'll, I'll get it for you. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Um, so anyway, that'll be happening within the next couple of weeks. Um, now. Typically, the reason that the warm room has been locked is that's where the key to the observatory has been kept. And so if you weren't trained on the 16-inch, you couldn't get into the warm room to get the key. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the key to, for the observatory to one of those realtor lock boxes, which will be in, in the warm room. And the people who have keys will be contacted about that. Uh, what else do I have for you? Okay, so later this month or early in June, we're going to be uh, begin doing the renovations and maintenance. You can see the roof on the, on the observatory is a little rusty. That's going to get painted. There's a little rot in, in a few places. We're going to deal with that. Um, the walls are going to get painted. And if you're interested in being part of the work party to do any of that stuff, just let me know. Again, at the contact email on the website. As part of that, we're going to be removing the 16-inch telescope. Uh, we'll be leveling the, flo the floor in there, and we'll be installing the 18-inch Star Master. And once the new scope, new, the, the new scope is in place, we'll install a digital lock on the observatory. And then when people are trained on it, they'll get the combination for that. The thinking is that uh, we're probably going to be building a, another observatory for the 14-inch that we have. And if we put in a third scope, we'll have a separate building for that. And then you can get trained on all of them and get the combinations to each observatory or just 
the one you're interested in being trained on. I just cut step on a lot of problems. Uh, Mike mentioned about the star party starting on the 27th. Um, if somebody's interested in helping with that, that would be great. Again, just contact me. Because I can't do that one. That one's Julia's birthday. Um, so if you're new to the club and you want some help with your equipment, these star parties would be a great opportunity. Just come out, set them up. There'll be lots of people there to help you. Um, and if you've only ever observed in the city, you're in for a real treat. I mean, the skies are, out there aren't the darkest in the world, but, but they're a lot better than in here. And you'd be surprised at what you can see. Uh, we're also hoping to corral Martha into organizing a few more uh, starbecues to go along with a couple of those events. And the dates we gave you, uh, these are going to be a, a go-no-go no go situation. If it's, if it's clear, we'll have the star party. If it's raining, it's gone. We're not going to go with rain dates. Because as you notice, they're usually within a week of the FLO, or the uh, CARP star parties. What? Okay, it's Chris playing. Okay. So anyway, the go no go will be made. The call will be made the same way it's, it's done with the CARP star parties early in early afternoon, the day of, and we'll, we'll deal with it the same way, emails are posting on the website. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we've got a change of schedule. Tim, are you ready? We're gonna power through this, just ignore that. <laughs> so we're gonna go right ahead and get Tim with the GA update. Thank you. No, not the word. Chris found me, so no problem. Okay, folks. Um, yes, I, I know we've been working pretty heftily on the GA. Um, we've only got about two months left before it and about a month left for registration. Our registration has been open for the last uh, month, approximately. We've got about another month beforehand. We'd love to run it a bit longer, but unfortunately, even in the days of just-in-time packing and processing all that stuff, it does take time to get things uh, ordered and, and in place. So, um, what I'm doing at this point is giving you a quick rundown on uh, what we've done. Uh, oh, big button, I guess. Okay. Um, we've apparently had some folks who've had some difficulties registering using the registration system. Now, I mean, we've tried to make it fairly obvious, but one man's obvious is another man's what? So, uh, we've walked you, oh, stop that. We've walked it through a, um, uh, walked you through registering, how to register a person and a person's significant other, or whatever you want to do. Chris, if you can roll that beautiful registration footage. Just click. I click? Hi, we're going to walk you through the 2017 GA registration process. Sounds like you, Jim. <laughs> Navigate to the Ottawa Center website at rasc.ottawa.ca. Scroll down and find the GA registration page. You'll find a summary of the costs and a large blue button to take you to our registration site. Start by entering the first person's contact information and center affiliation. Next, you can select the General Assembly events you'd like. A four-member registration, for example, the barbecue, the awards banquet, the optional Oliver Crater tour on the Monday, and tell us whether you'd like to come to see the Diefenbunker at no additional charge or visit downtown museums. Next, select the memorabilia you'd like to order. You can get a brief description of each item by hovering over the question mark. When you select t-shirts, you'll have an opportunity to enter the sizes. Don't forget to order about a size larger than you'd normally wear. That's the way these t-shirts are sized. Now you've entered the registration information for one person. You can either complete your registration or add another person. And here's the opportunity to review what you selected. Ignore this section here. It's not very important for our registration. I see we're out of sync. Here's the opportunity to register a second person. You'll notice that the first name field is blank. In this case, we can see that John is registering for Jane. In this example, Jane isn't an RASC member, so John will indicate that she's a guest. 
You can place anything you'd like in the badge field. Now, just as before, indicate what events you'd like to attend and indicate your memorabilia. You've now completed the registration for the main member and a guest. You have an opportunity to register still another person or to complete your registration. We'll just complete this one and now you'll get a summary of everything that you've done. Review this one. When you're happy with it, you'll have an opportunity to pay for your registration. Now this is actually in sync on the website. <laughs> if you've got any more questions, just contact us and we'll be happy to answer you. And we'll see you in Ottawa with the GA. Now this is available on the website, and it actually is in sync. Really, honest for true. Um, so this, this should, I think, help. If it's not clear, then for crying out loud, will you send us an email? If Brian and I can figure out how to do this stuff, anybody can. <laughs> Trust us on that one. You're looking at two of the greatest Luddites known to humanity here. So uh, let us know. We, we'll help. Really, honestly, truly. Um, really have to encourage uh, everybody in here. Um, we've done our best to make this as affordable as we can, and part of the thing that makes that work is having reasonable numbers. And I'm really going to encourage everybody in, in the Ottawa Center to really show up and help out um, by buying a membership and buying as much or as little as you can afford. Give till it hurts. Yeah, um, operators, no, forget it. Um, I'm not selling slap shops, seriously speaking, though. I mean, as many of you as, as can do it. Now, I understand, you know, things are always tougher than you'd like and uh, there's never enough money to do everything. But, uh, well, do give some thought to it. One of the things that we've really tried to do with this talk, with this GA, is to make an effort to bring in some of the best astronomy, the best Canadian astronomy that, that we can get in. We're bringing in people from considerable distance simply because we aren't going to see them all the time. Uh, this is stuff you're not going to be able to get at the uh, regular meetings. Uh, the public speaker fund is a good system for bringing in people from relatively nearby. We're bringing in people from considerable distance that I think will really give you uh, a really good view of Canadian astronomy, both from the amateur and the professional side. Um, so uh, check it out. Uh, do everything you can to try and support us. We actually had quite a bit of support. I'm, I'm really, really surprised at the number of people who uh, filled out that uh, voluntary uh, donation thing, which I tried to avoid being really in your face about it. But uh, we've, we've gotten, people have been extremely generous and extremely supportive of us. And uh, in the next months, I'm really hoping you're all gonna make me proud. <laughs> Could you resist these eyes? <laughs> and the space. <laughs> oh, well, sorry about that. Anyway, come to the flippin' GA. It'll be fun. We'll have good food. We're doing fun stuff. And, well, we'll, we'll try not to bother you too much about it. Yeah, and, I, and I guess one thing there is to, uh, we've got 400 members in our club. 400 members, and from Ottawa Centre so far, uh, about the first three, four rows, just this group here, are, is the number of people who have registered from Ottawa. That's all. <laughs> Guilt trip! I mean, you know, we've, we're, we, have to show, we have to show the rest of the RASC uh, what we can put on in Ottawa, and uh, I think we've got a really good deal on the go here. We're not having to pay for accommodation charges or, any, or transportation charges, so please, if you can do it, uh, come out and show the flag, and uh, let's show them what a vibrant centre we have. I mean, look, we've got, what, 120 people here tonight, and, and other centres would just... Uh, they kill for that. They, they'd kill to get uh, numbers like this out each night, so if we can, if we can get, uh, even if we could just take all of you and transport you right over the GA, we'd be rolling. If you pay. Couple of calendars here. <laughs> Couple of calendars here. We forgot to sell earlier. So for five dollars each, or if you want to put an additional donation with that as well. Thank you. <laughs> five dollars each, or one for ten. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Me again. Uh, before I left, I thought, should I ask for questions? I thought, no. So as soon as I sat down, Dave tapped me on the shoulder and said, what about, the thing I forgot to mention, typically there's a fee for the keys to, to use the, the facility. For the time being, we're going to waive the fees, okay? So there'll be no fees to use the warm room. 
will come up with some scheme to get money out of you eventually on that. Um, and until we get the 18 inch in place, if you're a key holder, your keys will still work. Um, and then once the 18 is in, everybody's going to have to get trained on it and we'll deal with stuff at that point. Okay? Thanks. Before we go on break, we have a little announcement. Um, I, I don't know what happened to the font, but hopefully you can read it a little bit. So our longtime member, Robert Dick, is holding an open house get together at his observatory. Doesn't that sound exciting? Um, so for more info, you can write to Rob. I believe the address is rdick at robertdick.ca. That's pretty straightforward, right? Um, if you really need contact info, you can write to me, and Robert insists that you write to him if you want to map directions. So he is going to be available at the break if you want more information. So I know this has been very long awaited, but we do have some survey results for you. So we sent out this survey a few months ago. We had some very good answers. Thank you very much. So Jim Sophia, who is one of your Ottawa counselors, has compiled and analyzed the data for you. The big green one. Good. Very good. Good evening, everyone. A survey was taken in February to better understand the interests and views of the membership and also to learn how certain projects and initiatives coincide with those interests. So I'm going to expand on these results, some of which was published in Astronotes just a short while ago. So first we're going to start with some basic information. There was a total of 116 responses or approximately 33% of the membership took part in the survey, which ran for 15 and a half days. Now just a reminder that uh, our interpretation of the results are only based on this sample, as well as the sampling of those members who chose to respond to specific questions in the survey. So some questions were answered by all who participated, and some were not, uh, for whatever reason. So with that in mind, this graph shows the length of membership of the survey respondents. And you can see a sizable chunk, 33%, were new members under three years. And this was mirrored by the fact that suggested presentations and workshops put some focus on the beginner as well as the quote-unquote expert. For example, how to choose a telescope how to set up various types of telescopic equipment, how to navigate the night sky, how to recognize the constellations, how to star hop, and so on. The bimodal nature of the distribution of the graph also show a high percentage of longer time members as well. And if you'll, do I have a, a little uh, laser beam? Uh, no, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Well, up on top, you see the stats for each question. Uh, 115 folks answered one. Skip that one. Okay. Learning about the Ottawa Center, RASC, often occurred through friends as well as the web and media. Survey feedback was quite positive with respect to the Ottawa Center ac activities as a whole. Positive comments about our meetings, especially the oral presentations, the wide range of topics covered, and the display of astrophotography was very valued. Our sponsored events, such as star parties, for example, were well received, and publications, such as Astronauts, Sky News, The Bulletin, and The Observer's Handbook, have high reported readership. This graph shows the proportion of respondents who attended a RASC, uh, RASC sponsored star party in the past. 
And for those who did attend, an overwhelming majority, 93%, rated the experience as satisfying versus neutral or poor. Suggestions regarding the benefit of having designated instructors on site to help those who might need technical assistance at stock parties were reported. An alternate East End location would also be appreciated. Oh, thank you. Now, while public outreach was viewed as very important in the survey, more members-only events, such as workshops and group observing sessions, were often recommended. The annual dinner, the annual dinner was attended to in the past three years by approximately 22% of the sample. More publicity and exposure to what the dinner entails may increase attendance. A number of newer members reported a hesitancy to attend, and some perceived the event as formal and cliquish, which would obviously negatively impact attendance. Now, Mike, for the dinner, do we still require black tuxedo with tails? <laughs> Just a little attempted humor there, folks. Don't take me seriously. They make you do it. All right. <laughs> Moving right along, the Ted Bean Telescope Library was used by almost 10% of the respondents to this question, as many reported no need to use the facility. However, those who did use the facility really appreciated the opportunity to learn about the instruments but wish that the equipment borrowed came with instructions and guidance. <laughs> the San Mont Library was, was used by 29% of the sample. Those that used it commented on the good selection, variety, and range of topics available. Such a resource may need further promotion among the membership. As part of the Smart Scope survey, members were asked if they would be interested in doing their own astrophotography. And as you can see, a very large majority, 67% of the 112 who responded to this question answered yes. As you see, uh, looking at this table, there appears to be some interest in SmartScope, as 41 out of the 106 respondents, or 38%, gave a 4 or a 5 interest rating using the facility. So here you have very interested and almost very interested, more or five. That's fairly good. And there are 11 that are not quite sure yet. Okay. This table gives a projected estimate of the scope's monthly use. It would appear that most individuals who responded to this question would use the scope once or twice a month. So there is, as you can see, uh, 48, which is uh, quite a large number. But as you can see, uh, there are there is a small group of hardcore users, more than four times, and we can probably pick them out in the crowd <laughs> if we could. Okay. This this is an important table. The table here, based on 33 respondents only, show the number of individuals willing to volunteer maintaining the scope in one or more areas listed. So in other words, uh, an individual who responds to this question can check off more than one area to help out. And this would be essential for the program to be viable. So as you can see, there are several areas listed 
a very important one, obviously, is the emergency response commitment. Uh, if we have a problem with the dome closing, for example, and it's going to rain the next day, we really need somebody to get out there and fix that. So we have 13 glorious individuals that have uh, at least indicated a, an interest in helping in, in that particular area. Moving along to the uh, Fred Lausing uh, Observatory uh, near the Mill of Kintail. It was visited by 57 out of the 110 respondents, or roughly 52% of the sample. Now those, for those who did visit Flo, especially like the darker skies and its reasonable distance to Ottawa. And just then, as an aside, uh, check out the light pollution map of the clear sky chart and see Flo's location relative to downtown Ottawa. And you'll notice the degree of light pollution represented by the color spectrum change as you move further west from the city. Now, there were some uh, critical comments uh, made about Flo, and I could see that, that there's some action taking place uh, very soon uh, because this is such a nice spot. Uh, there was some uh, criticism regarding the uh, uh, horizon uh, the, the condition of the buildings, which is obviously going to, uh, we're going to be fixing that. Uh, some indicated that the access road is a bit tricky and there's a lack of concrete pads to set up. However, with the needed repairs, the sentiment in the survey was that there is great interest in resurrecting this site. This is really a nice spot. Uh, approximately 77% of the sample use the site only and uh, as opposed to the equipment. So the 16 inches is also being used by, by a percentage of folks who visit Flow. As uh, Gordon indicated just a little while ago, of those who use Flow with their own equipment, 75% would use it more if they had access to the warm room. Certainly. The projected interest in using the 18-inch Dobsonian mounted Starmaster and 14-inch Mead SCT at Flow revealed 23 out of 95 respondents rated a moderate or extreme likelihood in using the equipment. So that would represent 24% uh, of the sample. With respect to the ride-sharing program, 31 out of 93 respondents, or 33% of the sample, stated that they would participate in helping others without cars attend meetings and events. And correspondingly, as a member who may need the service, 12 out of 52, or 23%, would be interested in using it. And I believe the ride-sharing program is web-based and is currently operational. Is that correct? No, yeah, we're not there yet. We're not. Okay. We started but, a forum. Pardon me? We started a forum. Okay. The survey revealed much interest in learning about astronomy. There is interest in mentoring, to members requesting support with their telescope and observing, and there were members interested in receiving such support. So along the uh, educational aspect, uh, we sampled uh, member-only classes in a variety of categories, observing the night sky, telescope maintenance, different levels of expertise in astrophotography, video astronomy, and solar observing. And as you can see from the numbers and the percentages uh, that, uh, you know, folks are really interested in learning about these areas. In particular, the introduction to uh, astrophotography demonstrated the most interest. 50 out of 78 respondents, or 64% of the sample, would be interested in such uh, a class. And fortunately, 
we have some individuals who would be willing to help organize such member-only events. Many concluding positive comments uh, about the center were made, such as the opportunity to learn more about astronomy, to attend star parties and public outreach activities, and socialize within the membership. More members-only events would be welcomed, such as workshops, star parties, impromptu observations, trips, and social events. RAS Council intends to follow up on some of these key suggestions and recommendations posed by the membership, and we really thank you for your participation in the survey. So. How long, yeah. Yeah, so is there any, do you have the data about the actual membership duration? So this is who participated in the survey. This is just who participated in the survey, right? But if, is it possible to look into the actual membership duration of each member? And is, is it similar to that graph or is it different? That's a good question. Uh, Chris, do you want to? Sure, but not off the top of my head like this. Okay. I have that data. Yeah, okay. Chris definitely has that data. We yeah, do. It's, 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 it's war beginners, but I'm, I'm thinking, just my own perception is we probably have you know, a few members in the 7 to 12 range. We probably have a lot of long term members. Yeah. A lot of new members. Yeah. So maybe is something similar to that. Maybe not quite so. Yeah. No, that's a very good question. And that underlines the, 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 the you know, the uh, caveat uh, I gave a little while ago that we're just looking at 33% of, of the total membership sample. So that's a good question. But it's nice to have some new blood. That's great. Wonderful. Fabulous. Thank you. meeting we have barely any observations from this but we have plenty so um, we do have some time but there are a lot of observations lined up so we are going to try to speed through this as much as we can so first up is Bob talk about a two-day moon, in case you can't read. <laughs> I took this photograph in February, and it's a two-day old moon with, uh, with Venus up to the right. Uh, and this is a little bit of a zoom in on it, February 28th, uh, with Venus. And if you look at it more closely, uh, this is what it does. And it, I. I took this with a DS, DSLR, so the resolution is pathetic, and it was with a uh, with a telephoto lens. But even so, you can still see the uh, the uh, uh, the curve of Venus and of the Moon being the same. The sun is down below in the setting sun, of course. Now, uh, when you look at this Moon, this is the one taken in March 29th, a month later, and uh, these two moons look different. Uh, uh, by the way, I just barely made it home. It had been cloudy and then suddenly cleared and I had a chance to take this picture in the trees. And here are the two pictures, the uh, February and March moons. And if you look at them, besides Venus not being in the bottom one, they're pretty similar, except for one little change. And uh, I'll give you just a little tiny hint here. 
This is what I was doing when I took these two pictures. <laughs> I was pretty happy about that bottom one. And this is in Orlando and Ottawa. And uh, I don't know if you can see the difference, but here they are again. Um, this is the Orlando moon, and if you go horn to horn, it's seven degrees. And the Ottawa moon, if you do horn to horn, it's 23.7 degrees. And then if you look at them like so, the angle of the moon is 16.5 difference, and the latitude is 16.3 degrees different. By the way, the angle of those moons is idiotic. Uh, the precision of the graphing of the, uh, of the uh, um, the uh, photo analysis program that I used allowed to give, gave it to me in tenths of a degree. I mean, give me a break. I can't hold a camera that straight. I don't know what the horizon is exactly. You know, that's idiotic precision. But anyway, the point is the latitude difference and the angle of the moon, pretty similar. Now, you know, uh, why would that be? Well, here's a, here's a picture of the Earth, which looks astonishingly like two protractors stuck together. <laughs> and uh, I've drawn a scale photo picture of me on standing on the moon at uh, approximately the right latitude of Orlando and Ottawa. And the moon, as it felt like it's seen. And I can see you all tipping your heads all crazy, right? So trying to see what, what you're looking at. So what I've done is I've just redrawn them with Orlando and Ottawa up so you now can have a better view. And you can see the moon in Orlando is lying on its back much more so than the moon uh, as seen from Ottawa. And, you know, when I talk to people who go down south to look at the sky, well, we're, all, we're all astronomers, and so we do look at the sky, and people talk about, oh, I can see stuff really low on the horizon, you know, stuff that you can't even see in Ottawa, I can see it down there. Or they'll talk about things that I can see in Ottawa are way higher in the sky, and what I see is this moon that's lying on its back. <laughs> it's just, uh, to me, it's really quite interesting. And I guess the only conclusion is here that next year I'm going to MHP Ottawa two day old moon in May instead of March. <laughs> <laughs> that was pathetic. Huh? You, you remember the big storm. All right, I have some actual images here. This is the coat hanger image. And uh, let's see if I can find the right buttons here. Um, why is it called the coat hanger? Well, for you folks with no imagination. <laughs> All right. And this is a friend of mine, Paul Shepard. This is his favorite thing. Every time he sets up a telescope, if this thing's in the sky, I get to look at it. So you call it, you should call it a Shepard asterism. Anyway, it's still pretty neat. Uh, you can tell it's a pretty wide angle camera that I'm using here. This is a, a Teleview 3 inch uh, uh, scope set on a, uh, a fairly big chip camera. And this is M8182. Um, I just had a chance to see that visually through Richard Harding's uh, Starmaster telescope, and it, 82 especially is just absolutely gorgeous in a telescope. The little galaxy up in the corner. And then I took a picture of one of my favorite, M63. And I took this picture in March, and uh, oh, I don't know, about a month later, Mike Wirth uh, posted that there was a supernova in this thing. Well, you know, you certainly can't see a supernova in this thing. It's just too wide angle. And I can zoom in a little bit. So I'll go from here to there. And so it's a little closer. You can see it's not a really great picture. There's not enough resolution in the camera. And then we can go in a little bit tighter, even yet. All right. And this is the pre-supernova March 22nd image of uh, M63. Now. Where would the supernova be in this galaxy? Uh, well, you know, I'm not going to find it on my own. It's, it's too dim. Uh, so you look it up. And this is a reference image from Rochester Astronomy. They have a pretty neat website with all kinds of supernova stuff on it. And that's where it is. So is it in my image, which was taken before the supernova? We, we shouldn't be there. And uh, color images are very difficult to see. Uh, differences in, uh, in intensity. So this is a black and white image. I just took the luminosity part of my image and looked at it here. And it turns out if you want to see differences in luminosity, it's actually better to look at, at a negative image. So I just, uh, I just reversed black and white. And uh, you can see there, pre-supernova, there's no supernova. All right? No supernova. So what's there after? So I managed to stick together some images, and here is the supernova 
on April 22nd. April 22nd. Now, if you look there, you can see there's a supernova there. There's a little faint, fuzzy spot there, which is the kind of thing I would show my wife if I wanted to annoy her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to see something spectacular, come and look at this little faint, fuzzy thing. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you about the supernova. It was, um, it was discovered by the GIA group, which is uh, Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge, and uh, was discovered April 9th. It's a type 1A uh, supernova, which is the kind which is a, a, it's a white dwarf, oxygen carbon white dwarf that's sucking stuff off of another star nearby. And eventually the star, the, the white dwarf, is bigger and bigger and bigger, reaches 1.44 times the size of the sun, mass of the sun, and the carbon ignites. And there's this big blast setting off the oxygen at the same time, and they fuse to higher elements than the carbon and oxygen. And uh, basically, it does that in six seconds. So the star basically vanishes in a big fireball, if you wish, uh, turns into billions of degrees at the core of the star suddenly, and you get the supernova. And the trick is, because it occurs at 1.44 of the mass of the sun, it's kind of like a standard candle. No matter where that occurs, it's about the same brightness. There are some differences, but it's about the same brightness. So it's a fabulous thing to look at. So the guys looked at this one, types 1A, and um, they also looked at the redshift, and they found the redshift was too high for being, it's not in M63. It's not in M63 at all, it's behind M63 somewhere else. And the redshift indicates that it's 40 times as far away as M63, which is 27 million miles away. That puts the supernova about a billion light years away. So uh, a billion years ago, the star vanished, 27 million years ago, it went through M63, and on April 22nd, a few photons crashed into my camera here on Earth. And uh, the thing about that is, the camera is only, the, the telescope is only a three-inch telescope. So it's not a particularly big telescope. Anyway, there we go. Cool. I didn't show my wife this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. Thanks very much. some pictures which I took uh, uh, in a span of time from uh, uh, September until now. The problem is that, as you know, uh, there was very little clear, clear night and uh, <coughs> there was really a few trips, maybe up to three to four trips, which I managed to make to uh, FLO. This is uh, the result of one of them. This is um, M33. It was up in the skies in uh, September, October. Um, uh, th this picture has been shown by other astrophotographers. I mean, a picture of M33. It's a beautiful, gorgeous object, pretty bright. Uh, in some cases, you can see it easily through binoculars. Uh, what is specific about this one, why uh, I wanted to show my version, is because uh, this was my first attempt to take guided pictures. So this is about two hours of uh, exposure. Uh, using a regular uh, DSLR camera, or actually, sorry, a modified camera. And because of the modification, some things which um, normally wouldn't be that bright, but they did show up um, in this picture, which is NGC uh, 604. It is a region in this galaxy similar to our Orion Nebula, but uh, it's only 42 times larger. Than Orion Nebula, so it's a place where stars are born, where there is lots of oxygen. Oh, sorry, where there is lots of hydrogen gas, and uh, it's so big that we can see that region from our galaxy, although it resides physically in the uh, M33 galaxy. Uh, I was pretty much surprised that uh, some of the details of that object could be seen in a picture taken from from our galaxy. Um, is it the right button? Uh, no, there's the other pointer. The other one, yeah. Um, oh, made a great presentation last meeting about the Leo triplet. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't take the whole triplet, so it's just a duo of uh, galaxies which are part of the Leo 
um, clusters, so this is M65 and M66. Um, again, these are guided shots, and uh, um, I, why I wanted to show it, because um, there is, uh, I'd say pretty much, some details showing up clearly about the dust planes in both of the galaxies. You can see how the dust twirls around with the mix of these lumps, brighter lumps, which is actually uh, the stars of the galaxy, which just look a little bit brighter because it's a collection, and uh, they shine brighter, making this impression that this is irregularity, which is actually the truth. This galaxy is irregular because they believe there is a gravitational pull that either of those galaxies pass close to the other or is uh, experiencing that pull. Uh, so uh, if you look closer, this disk is a little bit irregular. Uh, but this is a spiral galaxy. Unlike that one, this is the bar galaxy. You can see a bar inside, and uh, it goes like on straight across the center while the, um, uh, the, the arms go all the way around. And this is the very same uh, M63, uh, which I took um, three weeks ago. Ironically, it's exactly the same day when that uh, um, supernova was discovered. And I'm sure there is a little bit of it, but uh, when I found out that it was actually in a galaxy, as Bob mentioned, behind it, like 42 times uh, or something uh, further, then uh, I got kind of uh, disappointed uh, whether I'd be able even to see it, so I didn't pay much attention to, to the details, but if uh, I, I guess if I do more research, if I try to superimpose these pictures on those from previous attempts or uh, historical pictures, maybe there is a, this little dot uh, that did a great job trying to uh, extract as much information about, as possible about uh, the supernova, but uh, I, unfortunately I cannot show you uh, with this picture that this is exactly the spot where that supernova was discovered. Um, Jupiter, the last meeting, actually, next day after last meeting, was in opposition to the Earth. It was pretty bright, pretty uh, big. Uh, I didn't even have to use um, um, barrel lens. But this is a composition of a few images uh, taken within a uh, span of time. Uh, and part of that is uh, through Eric Lemay's telescope. So there is a two different sources of information um, super, superimposed, and uh, this is as much as details, uh, as much details as I managed to extract from it. Um, you know, well, this is uh, Io, the satellite, or Io. There is one thing here which is which is a bit kind of unusual. You know, there is a great uh, red spot, which is not on the side, but there is a white spot, which is right here. And this is a smaller, or they call it a uh, red spot junior, or oval BA, which was discovered in 2006. Apparently, it was not really discovered, it just appeared to be there, because, uh, as you know, the weather on uh, Jupiter is quite unpredictable and uh, pretty windy, so now and then these hurricanes form and uh, they create this uh, swirling patches of uh, gases which um, result in uh, this pattern of uh, hurricanes. Uh, they appear and they disappear. Apparently this uh, oval BA is pretty sad information, so it did not go away within the next 10 years, and we can still see it. It's facing straight to the uh, observer when this picture was taken. Um, in late October, um, me, Eric Lene, Andrew Brown, and Paul Cloninger made a trip to Lamar, uh, sorry, to Addington Highlands, where we saw these amazing bright auroras quite unexpectedly. The purpose was different, the, the targets were different, and the story is slightly different, but uh, it, this was so uh, magnificent, so bright, that all four of us just uh, uh, we decided, well, this is work of taking a shot, and this is one of the examples of what we saw that night. Uh, so this is straight north. You can see the dipper right here. So the polar star somewhere there, uh, straight from straight straight from the north. And on uh, southwest, 
this is what Milky Way looked like that night. Uh, I'm not sure if this is just the light pollution, which is very unlikely, but most likely I would imagine that the aurora would extend that much. You could see, still see some of the uh, greenish light here along the horizon. And uh, yeah, here are four of us cheering to the dark skies. And, uh, <laughs> it was ginger ale. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's also, I'm not sure if I can, if I can easily locate the very same dipper, but uh, yeah, it was quite an experience. Thank you very much. Okay, I just have two uh, moonshots here. This one was captured on uh, Saturday the 29th during Astronomy Day. Um, hopefully everybody had an opportunity to participate either in the activities here at the museum or at Chapter of Silver City. We had a great turnout there. Um, it was a lovely clear night, <coughs> even though it was a little chilly. And I did have an opportunity to, um, I had a video display of this live up for people to see and I was able to when people weren't watching, uh, capture some frames. So this is a uh, mosaic of two images that are each uh, made up of the best 300 frames from a capture of a thousand stacked and uh, wavelet supplied. And this image I captured back on the 8th of April in one of our rare evenings of clear skies that we had this, uh, this spring. Uh, it's about two days before the full moon, so the uh, terminator is almost all the way around to the uh, far edge of, uh, of the western edge of the moon. And this particular area is one of my favorite areas um, because it shows a lot of volcanic features all in one kind of compact area. So um, up here on the northern, north is to the top, or to the right here. You see there's uh, a series of domes here. There's one, two, there's a little guy there. Those are referred to as the Gruthizen domes. Gruthizen is the crater here that gives this area uh, the name. And these are confirmed through uh, spectrometer measurements to all the uh, older silica-based volcanic domes. Quite unusual in their height versus their diameter. Most of the other volcanic features on the moon are a lot flatter. So this is a, an interesting area to observe. And if you zoom in, you can actually see the, uh, the crater at the top of, of uh, Gruthizen. I think this is Gamma, Gamma Delta, and they just call this one Gruthizen Northwest. There's another tiny one here that's really hard to see, which I have not yet confirmed if it's volcanic, but it's uh, called um, what's it called? S uh, Carolyn Herschel Epsilon. Uh, other features of interest that are volcanic in origin, is we have a large uplift region here surrounding the Shoteri Valley, which is a volcanic feature. This is a, a rail caused by a flow of lava exiting here from an area called the Cobra's Head. And on really, really good nights of seeing, you can actually see the rill extend out into the, uh, the low lines here. I wasn't able to see it that night because the seeing was terrible, but um, if you're lucky, you can see it extend all the way out into the plains. Another interesting feature in the area, of course, is Aristarchus, one of the younger impact craters on, on the moon. It's very bright, very easy to see. And at high magnification, there's a lot of uh, intricate detail around the rim of the crater. And you can see some of the here, the striations of the bright and the dark material, which is pretty neat. The uh, final, well, actually, I skipped the volcanic feature. One that is actually quite difficult to see because it's so close to the western edge is uh, Mons Rumker. It's a it's a large uh, volcanic feature. It has about 40 different domes that assemble together to make 
a structure that is um, 500 to 800 meters tall and about 40, 40, 40 or 70, can't remember, kilometers across. So it's a massive volcanic complex. And uh, if you're lucky to get the moon just right, like it was on this night, uh, you can see some really intricate details of that feature, which is kind of neat. And the final volcanic feature is this region over here next to, next to Crater Marius. It's called the Marius Hills. So each one of those little domes is a volcano. Um, each one is on the order of one to two kilometers across and uh, two to 500 meters in height. And um, they are also relatively old, but uh, younger than the Gruthas and domes. The chemical makeup of this lava is quite different than this lava. You know, it's an interesting part of the moon to study when it's uh, near to full moon. And this is a um, mosaic of six images taken with a 10 inch RC scope. Each image is uh, the best 30% of 3,000 frames. Stacked in Registax and wavelet supplied. Oh, and it's infrared band only. So this is an infrared image of the moon, if you're interested. All right. Thank you. Want me to present it for you? <laughs> that works. That's too funny. I was just saying to myself, geez, that looks like my shot. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, the night that Harris was uh, talking about, where the four of us were up there. Um, and as I tell people, these time lapses that I uh, present, they come out of uh, essentially setting up a telescope and then it uh, do its thing, doing its thing for the next eight hours or so, and you kick back on a lawn chair and kind of think, okay, you know, what can I do in the meantime while my, my telescope is, uh, is uh, capturing images? Um, and so this sort of thing came about. I had wanted to take uh, auroras uh, up at my usual spot, um, and I'd wanted to do it for a while, while also light painting the uh, the cabin that's up there. So, what you don't see in the image here is the uh, the tripod bag holding up my headlamp, and uh, so it's it's a very dim white light, but it's just enough to to uh, to light up the, the cabin. And I'll just play that for you here. Should play. One thing you'll notice about these time lapses, there's lots of, uh, of lights that whiz by, and a lot of people ask me, are those meteors? Uh, meteors tend to get captured by one frame, whereas this is playing back 30 frames per second. So these are more uh, satellites and airplanes that are flying by that take uh, quite a bit longer to take to cross the entire sky. Um, so this this uh, this show of auroras was very strong at uh, at the beginning and it just tapered off. Um, and you can see the uh, there was a bit of wind there that night as well too, uh, as the grass is kind of swaying back and forth there. So while I was taking this image here, my telescope was uh, was acquiring. Uh, it, I think I was seeing the uh, the red and green channel of the Iris Nebula, which I I don't have to show for uh, tonight yet. I'm gonna be capturing more of that this summer. I've got 15 hours of exposure so far for that one. I'm aiming for about 30. This is uh, another time lapse I have for you tonight. This is at Starfest. Um, for those of you who have not heard of Starfest before, this is a, uh, an annual star party that happens uh, just south of Bowman Sound. Um, on, on a good year, you'll have a thousand astronomers there with their telescopes. 
this uh, this was last year where there, I think there was about maybe four or five hundred people at the most. Still, it's a lot of fun. The um, the large telescope in the foreground is the Teledanko's telescope, so it's a uh, it's a lot of fun uh, getting a chance to to look through all the different telescopes that are there. And uh, as we play this here, you can get a sense of the dynamics of the star party. Mm -hmm. The uh, the light pollution down towards the bottom there is uh, coming up from probably uh, Orangeville and uh, and Toronto. Still quite a ways away south, but it uh, still shows up. That's that one. Now this is uh, Labor Day weekend. Andrew and I headed up to the Algonquin Park, just uh, just a stone's throw away from the Algonquin Radio Observatory, and it is really dark up there. there you can see a bit of light pollution to the north, uh, east, um, or I guess it's more to the to the east at that point, from uh, from Pembroke. Um, so anyway, so we'll play this one here. So on this one, I'm using a slider. Uh, I've got a two-meter rail where the camera is, uh, while it's rotating to keep the, uh, the Milky Way in the center, it's also sliding two, two meters to the right. So you get a bit of parallax there, just a little bit from the, from the trees. The closer you are to an object, the more parallax you, uh, you get a sense of. It looks like there's moving structure in the air glow. So yeah, the it's, there, there is a little bit there, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, that's the observation. Eric, the, uh, rate, the speed of the uh, slider, uh, as it moves along the slider? Oh, it's like watching fingernails grow. <laughs> it's really <laughs> slow. So, um, so it, it will span, uh, I mean, it depends on how long you go. Uh, if you, say, program it for um, two meters worth of travel and you have 1,500 exposures, it will uh, it'll take a picture and then it'll move basically you know, an increment that's equally divided along that. Uh, so the more pictures you take, the finer that is, and when you get up into like 1,500 pictures, it really is like, you watch it and you can hear it, the, the motors actually spin, um, but you don't really appreciate too much motion. Um, so the, of course, the, more, the shorter the distance and the fewer the pictures, the faster it, uh, it moves. So this, uh, on the same night, uh, I decided to, to Initially, I wanted to uh, to take a picture and have star trails. I'd seen somebody uh, do that. I can't remember who it was. I think it was Dave Dev down at Starfest, and he had created this magnificent star trails uh, image. And it was just a still image, but I thought that's really cool. So I'm going to try to do that myself. Um, and I proceeded to set it up as though I was doing a time lapse, and then I would just take the the images, stack them all together, and I would I would get star trails. <coughs> then I had this idea. Um, you could play that, Chris, please. I decided to do that in a video. So right here. Glow, yeah. <laughs> so the one thing you can perceive here is that I was using a 14 millimeter lens, whereas on the other ones, I was, uh, on some of them, I was using a, a 24 millimeter lens. It's stretched a little bit here, so you can you can see where the the, uh, the north celestial pole is, and it's not exactly circular. That's because the the 14 millimeter lens is, is wide enough that it, it's it's skewing things. Uh, but what I, what I pr particularly appreciate about uh, this image, first of all, it shows you where the North Celestial Pole is. So if you're talking to somebody who doesn't know uh, sort of the general motion of the stars through the sky, this helps to, to explain to them uh, how the stars move through the sky. But it also kind of highlights the, uh, you know, the, all the trees being silhouetted. Th these are jack pines that are probably 100, 150 feet tall. What the image doesn't say, though, is the sounds that come from that, right? This is the Algonquin Park, and a porcupine walks by, you think, Woo! It's a bear! And you go hide in your car. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, what, uh, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you. stuff you have there. That's awesome. Uh, hi everybody, I just got a few quick ones for you here. I've uh, started practicing my solar photography. Uh, as you know, in three and a half months from now we're going to get a solar eclipse and I intend to be in the, in the path of totality. So 
you know, might as well start practicing there. So we, we did have a, uh, a, a good span in uh, April of uh, some good sunspot activity on, on the sun. I figured that, uh, that's an ideal target there. So this is, uh, this is a shot taken with a, just a 70 millimeter uh, Apo uh, and uh, a Canon uh, 70D. And uh, using a, a combination, actually this is a, a, a stack image, but it's using a combination of Thousand Oaks solar glass filter as well as a Bader um, uh, Mylar filter for a l a luminosity there. So you can see some of the granulation on the sun there and, uh, oops. Sorry about that. Oh. Wrong one. <laughs> can you go back one there, uh, Chris? There? I, I was uh, trying to access the laser actually. Sorry about that. Do we have a laser? Oh, yes, we do. Okay. So you can see uh, there's a, there are a number of groups uh, visible on the sun. They're a very faint group up there. there. But uh, this, was a, this was a lovely group in here. And, and this one, and this actually sparked some of the auroral activity that we had uh, early in April there, where we actually did have some, some clear nights there and, uh, and uh, people from around the area, uh, certainly in our area of the, of the world, did manage to, uh, to, to spy some uh, interesting auroral activity. We're in fact waiting for that um, in the middle of the month. There's a chance that uh, the coronal hole that had opened up in April, uh, if it survives its passage around the sun, uh, will uh, will be facing us in the middle of May, and uh, we may get another opportunity to uh, to, uh, to see some auroras. So keep your uh, auroral gear handy there, uh, uh, Eric. So yeah, just the fun. All right. Yeah. Uh, the, the other one. Oh. Thank you. Um, this one I tried to shoot uh, a number of comets uh, close to naked eye visibility are, are visible uh, or were visible in the sky last month. This is uh, uh, this was not a good night to shoot this. It started out very clear, but uh, a, a noticeable haze developed uh, very quickly there. Uh, but I got some interesting results there with the uh, with the haze coming through. So I thought I'd just shoot it anyway. Um, let's see if I can find the right button here. I'm, but, I'm button challenged. The, the other one. Oh, it is the other one? Okay. There we go. So there, there's Comet uh, 41 Pink Huddle. Um, the other objects in the field, there are actually stars. We have the various stars in the field. Uh, this one. Let's see if I can get this right. There we go. This is uh, Chuban and, and, uh, and Draco. It's uh, obviously a B class star there, a nice blue haze from the, uh, or glow from the, from the, uh, uh, the ever thickening clouds that were plaguing me that night. And uh, down below is a K class star, Tendraconus. Uh, so I, 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 like the, I, I like the blur actually, just to show off the color difference in those stars there. So I thought it made a, a nice contrasting trio with the, uh, the comet in green and, uh, and the two stars in, in their various colors there. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, uh, I didn't have another clear opportunity to get a really good shot of this comet, but yeah, it, it was there. It was there. All right. And uh, the last one I have for you. Last month, I, I talked about the galaxies in Leo. Uh, I did have one, uh, one very clear night um, since, since that meeting and was able to obtain some, uh, some much better data on uh, one of my favorite galaxies in, that, that I talked about, which was M95. I just wanted to show you the chart again to show you where it's located, just in the, uh, um, under the belly of Leo there. And uh, there, that's uh, M95, the, uh, oops, I don't know, I am really button challenged tonight. Sorry, Chris, can you go back? There we go. I'm going to use the right one here. But uh, yeah, there's, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, spiral arm data came up uh, much better. You can see some of the reddish nebulosity there. Still wasn't a super night, but it was better than the, uh, the nights that I had had previously to, uh, to, uh, to image the, uh, the stuff that I showed you from last month there. But uh, again, really nice galaxy. One of the brightest galaxies in the, uh, in the, in the LEO-1 group, about 38 million uh, light years from, uh, from here and about 75,000 light years across. So similar in size to our own Milky Way. But yeah, you can see definitely the, the, the dust lane detail uh, uh, going through, uh, through the various spiral arms. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you.
but uh, really as soon as the meeting is over, we're gonna pull door prizes and then everyone has to get out as soon as possible. I think it's um, like six and seven year olds tonight who are having a sleepover, so we'd like to get them in bed. <laughs> So we still stick with the month, Explore the Universe Guide by Brenda Shaw. This is an RASC publication. So it is uh, an introductory book to the ETU certificate program. And what those, what that is, is uh, observing certificates. So you can observe like a group of things, check it off the list, and then you can get certificates, you can get prizes. And this is actually something we're going to talk about in the upcoming months, and we're going to really promote those programs because we noticed in the survey as well that it's something of interest, but that we really don't talk about enough. So if you're interested in getting started, that's a complete guide to the certificate program. Membership, as usual, a regular membership, $75. Youth membership, $45. Family, $7. Uh, $70 with added fees. Um, I didn't have time to go through the membership benefits before the, before the break, but of course there's access to the Stanmod Book Library, Ted Bean Telescope, Loan Library, and the grounds of the Fred Lawson Observatory. I believe the key charge is $35 more. Uh, and you get access to these publications, Sky News, which is now owned by RSC, uh, the Journal, the Observer's Handbook, and Astronauts Online. Club information. So the meetings are usually webcast online. They are not tonight, it's a special exception. Um, but they can all be revisited on Ustream, RASC Ottawa Live, and they are posted on YouTube afterwards. So audience, 97, not bad. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to all the speakers. As usual, we are going to, Gracie's, come on guys. <laughs> so, we're going to meet at Grease O'Malley's if you'd like to come out for some food, some fun. Um, it's right down Ogilvy Road, so you go down <coughs> Aviation Parkway, turn right on Ogilvy, and you can't miss it, it's right there. So our next meeting, June 2nd, at the same place, same time, 7.30pm. So I hope to see you there. Have a good evening. <laughs>